아, 안녕하세요. 국립현대미술관 MMCA 프리밍 비디오가 준비한 이야기의 재건 시리즈 두 번째 시리즈인데요. 이야기의 재건 2, 던컨 캔벨, 오톨리스 그룹, 그리고 와일 샤키라는 프로그램인데요. 어, 영국 아티스트 두 분, 던컨 캔벨, 오톨리스 그룹하고 그리고 이집트의 와일 샤키 감독님의 거의 어, 싱글 채널로 가능한 거의 모든 작품들을 상영하고 있습니다. 그리고 어제 오톨리스 그룹의 어, 아티스트 토크에 이어서 오늘은 이집트의 아티스트 와일 샤키 감독님과의 대화가 이제 곧 시작될 예정인데요. 일단 와일 샤키 감독님을 아, 소개해 드릴게요. 간단하게 소개를 해 드릴 텐데요. 어, 와이샤키 감독님은 어, 필라델피아에서 어, 공부를 좀 하셨었고요. 그리고 어, 십자군 전쟁 시리즈 3부작을 최근에 이제 완성을 하셨는데요. 어, 십자군 전쟁 시리즈 1하고 3는 사실 한국에서 상영이 된 적이 있어요. 그런데 이제 투, 두 번째 작품은 소개된 적이 없고요. 그래서 이번에 저희 그 이야기의 재건 시리즈에서 와이샤키 감독님 3부작 전체를 어, 다 보실 수 있는 기회를 어, 마련을 했고요. 어, 와이샤키 감독님은 필라델피아와 이집트로 가시면서 굉장히 왕성한 작업 활동을 하고 계시는데 이 작품은 3부작 전체가 다 인형으로 만들어진 작품입니다. 어, 그래서 오늘 그이 작업 과정의 이야기들과 또왜 어떻게 이런 작업을 하시게 되셨는지 등등의 많은 이야기들을 들을 수 있는 기회가 될것 같습니다. 일단 와이샤키 감독님 소개해 드립니다. 박수 부탁드릴게요. 네, 네. 아, 저, 저희 통역하시는 이현정 선생님 소개해 드릴게요. 네. 네. So, Uh, good afternoon. You've come to the second part of Reconstruction of Story 2, involving Duncan Campbell, the Otterleith Group, and Wild Shockey. And yesterday we had the Otterleith Group, and today we have Wild Shockey, um, who has made a trilogy involving the Crusades. To give you a little bit of an introduction about him, um, he has studied in Philadelphia, and he recently finished his tr a trilogy about the Christian Crusades. And part one and part three have been shown in Korea before, but part two has never been introduced within Korea. And in this program, you'll be able to see all three films. And um, he is currently very active uh, in both Philadelphia and Egypt. He goes back and forth. And his films, his works, it all involve puppets. And so today, you'll be able to learn about how everything came together and why everything came together. Uh, 카바레 3부작은 제가 알기로는 어, 아민 말라프라는 그 어, 프렌치 레바논 작가인데요. 어, 이분이 쓴 에세이의 영감을 받아서 어, 작업을 하게 되었다고 들었습니다. 또이 책은 또 아랍 역사학자인 우사마 이븐 문짓 제가 발음이 좀 힘든데요. 아, 이분의 어떤 연구 자료를 바탕으로 해서 어, 대본이 쓰여졌다고 제가 알고 있습니다. 어, 어찌됐든 이 십자군 카바레 3부작을 만들게 된 계기와 또그 배경에 대한 이야기를 들어보도록 하겠습니다. So from what I know, you were inspired by the essay uh, written by the French Lebanon writer Amin Malaf, and also the script was ki um, kind of based on Usama Ibn Munjib's research materials. So could you tell us about how you came across this and what inspired you to make it? Thank you so much. Thanks so much for this great uh, invitation and uh, attendance. Um, okay, so, um, Yeah, I would like to maybe to go back to the time when I started uh, this series called Cabaret Crusades. Um, actually, before I made Cabaret Crusades, I was invited to um, sort of a residency actually in Kenya. And I made a small, uh, uh, I would say it's like a sketch for this whole series uh, with a film called Telematch Crusades. 
it's from another series, actually, it's a, it's a series called Telematch that is uh, finished with this film in 2009, Telematch Crusades. And it was, it was only the beginning for me to start to think about how to, to start the, to research more about the Crusades history because, of course, I didn't know enough to, 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 build, to build even a film about it. So uh, the beginning of this whole research was by reading uh, a novel by a Lebanese uh, French author, Amin Malouf, who made a book that was published in 1984 uh, called Crusades Through Arab Eyes. For me, this book is very important. It's very interesting because it, uh, it shows the, the, this uh, um, history from, uh, uh, I can't say fictional, but it's really, uh, let's say, it's, it's more readable format. And uh, I would say that uh, Amin Ma'louf, uh, for, for me, is very interesting because of the title of his book, Crusades Through Arab Eyes. And for me, that was really the way I was thinking about history and uh, how can I see uh, history and how can I translate history. So I don't really believe in history that much. I really believe that it's a human uh, translation. It's a human interpretation. It depends who is writing this history. So the idea that it's the same history that people know, but it's from the Arab point of view, that was really, really important to try to think the same way. So I decided to use his way of making this book, as, as I said, as a, as a first stage. Uh, but I, but to, to build the script of the film, I used his sources, which is, of course, based on these Arab historians who lived during the Crusades time and after the Crusades time. One of them, and it's a very important figure, is someone called Usama ibn Munqidh. And Usama ibn Munqidh was a historian who lived during the Crusades time. At the same time, he was the foreign ambassador of Damascus. So he played several roles actually in this film. And I, I, I had to put him as a figure also. He was, he's playing in the film also, uh, we will show it later, as one of the, of the figures. Because he, he made something very important in this film. He, went, he was sent to Jerusalem to sign the first peace agreement between Damascus and the Crusaders. So the Crusaders were already settled in Jerusalem th during this time, and uh, the, the ruler of uh, Damascus during this time, someone called Mu'in al-Din Onur, sent him to, to Jerusalem to make the, the peaceful agreement. And when he went to Jerusalem, he also wrote very interesting, uh, I would say, observations about his point of view about the European Crusaders. And from this point of view, I made a song, and, it, and uh, he played his role to, to, to present his, uh, his point of view about the Crusaders. Okay, just to continue the... Um, um, so, of course, in, in this series, we're, we're not only depending on Osama ibn Munqid, we're depending on other also uh, Arab historians including someone very important called Ibn al-Athir, and another person called Ibn al-Qalansi, and uh, someone else also was very close to uh, Salah al-Din, called Baha al-Din ibn Shaddad. Um, so okay. Yeah, and the uh, last one was the one that was uh, close to Salah al-Din is Baha al-Din ibn Shaddad. Baha al-Din ibn Shaddad. Yeah, believe me, if I am translating Korean, I'm like, I would be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
<웃음> 그, 이, 이, 이 발음하기 어려운 이름들은 네, 그, 어, 감독님이 얘기하신 걸로 저희가 그냥 듣고 이해하는 식으로 가는 게 나을 수도 있을 것 같아요. 그죠? 네. 네. 일단, 어, 지금 말씀하신 것처럼 이 그, 우사마 이든 문기의 어떤 자, 그 연구를 기반으로 해서 또 아민 말라프의 책의 영감을 받아서 어, 대본이 쓰여진 것으로 이제 저희가 이해를 하게 되는데 사실 집자군 저희가 알고 있는 원정은 여덟 차례에 걸친 정말 긴 여정인데 어, 영화를 3부작을 이렇게 보다 보면 사실 쉽지는 않습니다. 저희가 그 지금 보면은 그 십자군 카바리 1편, 그러니까 호러쇼 파일이 십자군 원정 첫 번째를 다루고 있고 또두 번째 어, 그 어, 시리즈 카이로로 가는 길 이거는 어, 1차, 2차 십자군 원정을 다루고 있고요. 그리고 세 번째 그 십자군 카바리 3, 3편 카르발라의 비밀은 어, 2차 또 3차, 4차 이렇게 어, 다루고 있는데 이게 저희 이 십자군 전쟁 자체에 대한 그 역사적 배경을 저희가 정확히 알지 못하는 관객들의 입장에서 볼 때는 사실 굉장히 그 비슷비슷해 보이기도 하거든요. 그래서 이거를 쫓아가는 게 쉽지는 않은데 어, 어떻게 이그 서구적 관점에서의 십자군 전쟁에 대한 것과 또이 무사마 아, 아 무스, 우사마 이든 무니크가 바라본 관점에서의 어, 무슬림과 기독교인 간의 갈등과 이 전쟁을 다룬 것들이 어떤 차이를 가지고 있는지를 좀 짧게 설명을 해주시면 고맙겠습니다. Uh, so in the beginning, actually, I didn't know that I will be making a series. Of course, in the beginning, it was an idea to. to work on the history that it's dealing between. I was thinking about making the first crusades, the second, and the third in one film. Of course, I discovered that this is just a dream. And in the end, uh, the first film ended up with the first four years out of the 200 years of the crusades history, which was very, very important and enough for the introduction of the series, actually. Um, I was uh, invited to, to Biella at Michelangelo Pistoletto Foundation in 2010, where I made really the first production in, in Italy. Um, well, the first production, because, because it was, uh, as I said, it was only, even for me, it was in, in the, the beginning of reading and uh, trying to understand uh, how can I deal with the, with this concept? I was sure that it has to be marionettes because of the, the idea of manipulation. We can talk about this also later. Um, but I, uh, I was thinking in the end that it's, it's, really, it's really important to try to, to find marionettes. I didn't know even in the beginning that it will be marionettes that I can make or I can find. Anyway, I was really, really lucky enough to find fantastic historical marionettes that dates back to 200 years old uh, in what it's called Lupi Collection. Uh, and this is, of course, this is one of these marionettes. This is historical European Italian marionettes. Uh, so with the help of Pistoletto Foundation, they managed to lend us this museum lent us over 110 uh, historical marionettes to make the first film from and i think it was really great and it was uh, it was uh, basic let's say i will show a little part of the film now um, but the idea that it was uh, let's say it was uh, although it is yes based on the arab historians uh, documents that I collected during the, this time, but the visual for me was, I think, more European. It was, it was like more Renaissance. Uh, even the, the, the way of making scenography in this film was like, uh, like more realistic than any other film I made after. Um, and I will just show an example so we can continue after this. <laughs>
So, uh, okay. Anyway, this is just an example just to show the difference. This is, uh, that was in 2010. So, um, yeah, concerning the, um, the first film, I think the first thing was uh, uh, really like striking for me in the beginning of, of this research is uh, when I started to, to read about the, the speech by Pope Urban II that happened in 1095. Um, so um, just to make it ve very, um, very quick, okay. Uh, this character here that we see is uh, this one. Yeah, we see this character in the film. His, his name is Alexius I Comnenus, and he's the emperor of the uh, Byzantine. Uh, uh, that he was uh, seeking the help um, because during this time, of course, uh, Constantinopolis was uh, uh, Christian before it becomes uh, uh, the Suljic Turks was really threatening this, his empire, the, the Byzantine Empire, and he was trying to, to seek help by sending uh, messages to Pope Urban II, who will find that this is uh, an excuse to to uh, uh, reach Constantinopolis. So, in that case, in that that was the beginning of the film is sort of um, trying to make a connection between the Catholic Church that is presented by the by uh, Rome and the Orthodox Church that is uh, presented by Constantinople. So um, Alexis Komnene sent to Pope Urban II. Pope Urban II, the following year, uh, make a big conference, supposedly, in South France in uh, a city called uh, Clermont. So the Council of Clermont considered the beginning of the whole Crusades history. He gave this speech, some people saying that it lasted for 10 days. I don't know, it's a bit a myth. What's more important to me than all of this, that if we try to search for this speech today, which is the most important speech, we find four to five different versions of the same speech, because it was not documented during the speech itself. So we know the result, but we don't know exactly what Pope Urban II said. We can just assume that he had amazing charisma enough to convince people to walk basically from Europe to reach Jerusalem. The trip took over four years and supposedly half of these people died because, because of the hunger, because they were extremely poor, they didn't even have horses and, and many of these uh, elements that we can see in, see it written in both sides, the Arab uh, historian sources and also the European sources. Um, so for me that was also very important to say that be this speech was not documented and it tells something about the written history. And so it was written after that. So um, I tried to think how this speech would be, would be made. So of course I collected the most uh, used ones, which is really not, not accurate also, but it's really also presented here in this film. the 그이 역사적인 이야기를 조금만 더 하고 제작 과정의 이야기를 들어보도록 할 텐데 어 예를 들면 이제 그 십자군 어 카발레 그 2편이죠. 카발 카발라로 가는 길 어, 카발라의 비밀 같은 경우 어 이게 그 680년인가요? 예. 카발라 전쟁을 다룬 건데 어 카발라는 바그다드 남부에 있고요. 근데 
이게 바로 그 지금 저희가 알고 있는 그 아랍 쪽에서의 순위파와 아 시지아파가 나눠지게 된 어, 어떤 결정적인 어떤 시점인 것으로 알고 있습니다. 그래서 이, 이 부분이 굉장히 어, 지금 오늘날 우리가 현재의 어떤 어, 상황을 여러 가지로 생각해 볼때 굉장히 중요한 부분인 것 같아서 어, 이 부분과 관련된 어떻게 이런 것들을 그, 어, 어, 대본을 통해서 그러니까 이 작업의 대본을 통해서 어떻게 그 구성하려고 했는지를 좀 설명을 해 주셨으면 좋겠습니다. 음, 오케이. Yeah, if if we try to make it uh, also, yeah, as I said, if we try to make it uh, first, we, we we talk about the second part, and then we talk about the third part. So I think the the, the second part, which called Cavalry Crusades: The Path to Cairo, it's um, okay. This is the second film that deals with the historical period for the Crusades between eleven uh, one thousand ninety nine. Which is the time when the Crusades already entered Jerusalem, and they settled in the region. So they have uh, uh, four different uh, provinces. Let's say that one of them is Jerusalem, another one is Edessa, and uh, Aleppo, uh, and Tripoli. So um, after this time, from this time. We have the first, the second crusade, which which is called the Path to Cairo. Actually, the Path to Cairo for me, you, we don't see Cairo in this film almost, but it was for me like the preparation to make Cairo is the center of power in this region. Before that, it was actually Damascus and Aleppo. Before this time, so um, we're talking about something between uh, uh, 1099 to 1146. 1146 is the, the, the killing of a very important uh, Muslim leader during this time. His name is Ahmed al-Din Zinki. Uh, uh, yeah, so I finished the, the second part with the, of Kabir, uh, the path to Cairo with this. But it's also mentioning very important uh, uh, split that's happening in uh, Muslim uh, world, which is the Sunni-Shia uh, uh, split, um, and I'm also mentioning here a very important uh, group that is called Hashashin. Hashashin group is uh, funded by someone called uh, Hassan Sabah, and the, he found a place supposedly in Iran called. Uh, uh, Alamout uh, Castle, um, and this this uh, uh, person is a very important leader, uh, coming from a sect, a Shia sect called Ismaili Nadari. Um, his mission really was to kill. Um, uh, as much as possible Sunnah leaders, and also he killed many of the of the crusaders as much as he could. So we see in the film many uh, uh, assassinations happen during this group. From this group, Hashashin, supposedly the word assassins appeared. So this is the first really uh, professional uh, uh, assassin group uh, ever happened. Um, yeah, so maybe just to make it close because the, the, the topic is, is very big, big uh, but I, I can just talk, I want to talk a little bit, a bit about the, the making of the second part of, of Cabaret Crusades, the path to Cairo. But before that, we can translate this part, please. Okay, what we see here now is a painting by a Bosnian artist and geographical uh, and engineer and many, many things. His name is Nasu Matrixi. He lived in the 16th century, and he made many maps for the area, including he made maps for uh, Constantinople, he made also for Aleppo, Edessa, uh, Cairo. Um, and uh, I decided to use his maps 
as the bad people, although they are like really later from the time that we're talking about, but I decided to make them as the background of the second part of Gaber Crusades. And uh, it's, um, we, we will show part of, of the second part now, the path to Cairo. So this is, the, the figure that we're seeing now is Hassan Sabah, the founder of Hashishin Group, as I've seen it in the first film, in the second film. Can we put the light? ينبغي أن تسير التحضيرات في سرية تامة على أن يتم التنفيذ في العلن وليكن المكان هو المسجد واليوم هو الجمعة ظهرا Um, so, for example, here, um, Hassan Sabah was uh, a friend uh, of a very important poet. During this time, his name is Omar Al Khayyam. So, I decided just to present. Hassan Sabah, because actually when we try to search for the, the documents about Hassan Sabah, we won't find almost anything. Most of the things are really disappeared. So we have to really to, to recreate this history by ourselves. And that's why also maybe it's uh, this group of al hashashin is connected to many stories that we don't know if it's fantasy or if it's true. 
For example, one of the stories that is very famous that Hassan Sabah had this beautiful palace, which is uh, Alamout Castle, that he uh, brings all the, his uh, um, uh, people that, that, uh, that want to have uh, drugs, hashish. That's why it's coming, the word hashishin. Uh, and he give them hashish and uh, women, and then he throw them out of this garden. And in order for them to come back, they have to kill certain people. We don't know if this is really real or not, but anyway, this is one of the stories. So we don't know really what is, what is it exactly. That's why I had to connect it to this specific poem by Omar al-Khayyam. Um, so I will, go, I will go back to the story of the Sunnah Shia split because this is really more concentrated in the third film. Cavalry Crusades, The Secrets of Karbala. But before we go to the third film, I would like also just to, to show a few things from the second film, The Path to Cairo. I would like to show, um, yeah, yeah, just another example about this type of music that I'm using in the second film, because it's, uh, it's a very particular uh, traditional music coming from Bahrain, and it's called the Pearl Fishing Music or they call it the uh, Livjeri music. Um, I just decided to use it in this film, although it really has no historical connection to it at all, but I just always was fascinated by this type of music and I found it really, uh, uh, it's, it's really masculine and it's really, it has a rhythm that it's really driven by the boats. That, so it's really coming from um, for me, it's like like nomadic opera somehow, and I found it really connected somehow to this uh, the history. So you, most of the time in the second film, I decided to use Levjeri music on certain uh, figures, um, and uh, I used other wave music, which is called radut, which is really more like like uh, a Shia. Uh, a religious person who tells the story of the killing of the grandson of the prophet. It's a bit complex, but anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a way of, of uh, saying this story. So uh, here we see Abu Sa'ad al-Harawi, the judge of Damascus. After the crusaders arrived already to Jerusalem in 1099, so he's seeking help now. So.
hear the lyrics, I don't really write these lyrics. I mean, I try to find the, the historical source for this. So this is a poem that was written for this exact occasion during this, uh, that was in 1099. So I also, I put it on uh, Abu Saad al-Harawi to, to say it. Um, so the last thing I would like, uh, the last thing I would like to show from this film is maybe we go back to Busama ibn Munqib. Yeah, it's a musical film, so this is really part of it also. So this is Usama ibn Munqib here. Usama ibn Munqib, yes. Yeah, I know that it's written. جميلة هي دمشق. هذا الأتى بكل وغد يحلم بضمها إلى باقي مدن الشام. لن أسمح بهذا ما حييت. يجب أن تذهب مرة أخرى إلى القدس. لتأكيد التعاون الفرنجي الدمشقي هذه المرة سوف تحمل لهم مقترحات محددة للغاية يرغم الجيش الفرنجي زنكي على الابتعاد عن دمشق يتحد الجيش الدمشقي مع جيش القدس في حال نشوب خطر جديد يدفع معين الدين أونر عشرين ألف دينار ذهبا لتغطية نفقات العمليات العسكرية يتولى أونر قيادة حملة لاحتلال قلعة بانياس وأخذها من زنكي وتسليمها إلى ملك القدس حضرت بطبرية في عيد من أعيادهم وقد خرج الفرسان يلعبون بالرماح وقد خرج معهما عجوزان فانيتان أوقفوهما في رأس الميدان وتركوا في رأسه الآخر خنزيرا صمتوه وطرحوه على صخرة وسابقوا بين العجوزين ومع كل واحدة منهما سرية من الخيالة يشد منها والعجوزان تقومان وتقعان في كل خطوة Okay, 
<coughs> so this is that was Osama ibn uh, The idea here, of course, that uh, the second part, the path to Cairo, is focusing more about the let's say the internal conflicts because. We see that the Crusaders already settled, as we said, in the region. So we see uh, the relationship between the Muslim leaders with each other most of the time. And also we see the relationships within one family, like two brothers uh, ruling two different cities, uh, Radwan and Dakkab, for example. Um, and then we go through, as I said, uh, a very important leader called Ahmad al-Din Zinki that was, in the end of the movie, assassinated also by Hashashin. So it's like referring to, I cannot say that Hashashin is presenting the Shia in this film because it's, as I said, it's only one sect from Shia, it's Ismaili Nadari. Um, but it's also it was all, always played uh, uh, as a as a role I think in this uh, in this conflict uh, the Crusader time um, and then for the third film that we will speak about now I thought it can be really great to start with having flashback to the main battle that caused. The, the, the split between Sunnah and Shia, which is the Battle of Karbala. It's a very sensitive topic for uh, Muslims in general. Um, but what I found it uh, very important to mention is the, the, the most common, let's say, that both agrees on. So Sunnah and Shia agrees that there is a battle happened, and in this battle, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad was killed. So nobody is really uh, denying this. And also 18 members of the family, uh, of the Prophet family mem uh, members were, were, were killed. Uh, but we don't know what happened after, of course. There is a lot of different stories. Also, again, it's like, it can be myth, it can be used for political reasons. We don't know. Okay, so, um so what happened 50 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the battle happened, and it's, as I said, it's between two groups. One of them is led by someone called al Hussein, which is the grandson of the Prophet. And another group was supposedly led by someone called Yazid ibn Muawiyah. But in the end, Yazid was not part of this battle. He was not really himself existed, but he sent other people. That's why it's really, it's a place for debate, like really nobody can accuse him personally, but okay. Anyway, just to make it simple, after the battle and after the killing, the split happened that people who are supporter of the grandson of the prophet call themselves Shia, and the rest was supposed to be actually the majority of Muslims is called Sunnah. But this is again not really correct because Sunnah now think that Yazid ibn Muawiyah uh, is also uh, a good man as Al Hussein, but it just like a conflict happened. This is the only difference that we see. Um, yeah, so anyway, I decided not, of course, to show Al Hussein the, the figure himself but also I just spoke about him in the film. Ya Hussein, do you see that the water is a river that is a river of the sea? And you don't see it from it until you die. Yeah, Hussein, do you see that the water is a river of the sea? Yeah, Hussein, do you see that the water ينزل الحسين وأصحابه على حكم عبيد الله وإن أبوا فازحف إليهم حتى تقتلهم وتمثل بهم 
فإنهم مستحقون قبح الله ما قدمت به علي لا يستسلم والله حسين إن نفس أبيه لبين جنبيه وما زال ينادي فيهم عليه السلام ألست ابن بنت نبيكم وابن وصيه وابن عمه وأول المؤمنين المصدقين لرسول الله بما جاء به من عند ربه ولم يقلب في ذلك اليوم حجر ولا مضر إلا وجد تحته دم عبيط انهض بحق شرف الشهادة الطاهرة
있고 그, 그 당시에 프랑코족이 세금을 징수한다든가 뭐 코트교도 있고 유대인도 나오고 굉장히 상황이 복잡한데 그게 그 아까 가족이라는 말씀하셨는데 그 살라딘이 맞나요 이름이? 어쨌든 그분 그 재상이었나? 이 사람을 둘러싼 이 사람 살라딘이 죽기까지의 이 논쟁과 이야기들 전개되는 그 어, 구성이 굉장히 밀도가 어, 어, 높, 높게 느껴지는 그런 구성이었던 것 같습니다. 어, 그리고 지금 이제 3, 3편으로 카르발라 비밀로 이렇게 넘어오는데 카르발라 비밀 같은 경우는 좀더더 더 몽환적으로 느껴지는데 그것도 물론 이따가 또 말씀하시겠지만 어, 그 만들어진 어, 소재가 어, 2부가 어, 도자기 인형이면 3부로 오면 이제 그 유리 크리스탈로 만들어진 인형인데 이그 전체적으로 그 어떤 제식이라든가 음악도 아까 저희가 들었지만 의식 이런 그 당시 에 있었던 노래라든가 이런 그 제스처 모든 것들이 어, 2부하고는 또 다른 좀더더 더 추상적인 그 어떤 그 구성이 되지 않았나 하는 생각이 듭니다. 그러니까 일단 그 저희 개인적인 어떤 그 의견을 좀 말씀을 드리고 어 지금 3부로 2부에서 지금 3부로 옮겨오고 있는데 어 감독님이 또 거기에 관련된 어 역사적 배경에 대한 이야기를 또 들려주시면 될것 같습니다. Uh, if we're talking about material, of course, it's it's very important. As I said, the first part was uh, historical marionettes, and it's wooden marionettes. So this is really something I did not really uh, make anything. We just choose. Uh, changed the costume, and we added some hair and maybe some makeup for some of the marionettes. Renovated many of them because they were really in a bad condition. Okay, the second part is, uh, for me, is more significant, of course, because it's uh, it's the marionettes that uh, I made. It's designed myself, and uh, it's made out of uh, clay. And it's very important that it's made out of clay. I was invited to make the second part in a place called Oban. Oban is very close to Clermont, where the 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 crusades, the first crusades, were were, were launched in 1095, as I said. And uh, in Oban, they have an amazing historical, traditional technique about making something called santons. Which is a very small figures that it's presenting the the journey of the Christian Holy Family, um, uh, Jesus Christ and Mary, and uh, they find you can find this in almost every church in in Italy. Uh, so, with the same people who are making these these historical uh, figurines. I decided to work with them for about maybe it took us almost eight months to try to make marionettes out of ceramic and it was really big challenge for them and so this is very important also because we are using a Christian traditional European technique in order for us to build marionettes to tell the story of the Crusades but from the Arab point of view. And all these type of shifts, I think it's extremely important for my work because it's really what I'm building the entire uh, series about. Um, also, because I felt it's very relig religious and the idea of using clay also, somehow in, in the Islamic culture is also religious because we're supposedly made out of clay as human beings. Uh, so the, all these connections was, was very important and significant for, the, for making the marriage out of ceramic. So when I decided to make the third film, I was also again thinking of how to link, uh, of course, it, how to link the scenography and the historical period that I'm working on in the third film with the, the new type of marionist. I didn't know the material that I need to use yet. Um, so. For the third film, we're speaking about the time between 1146, as I said, it's the death of Ahmad al-Din Zinki, and uh, then his son, Nur al-Din Zinki, is becoming the leader of the Muslim uh, region, uh, 
yeah, mainly during this time was Aleppo, basically. And then we go through uh, the time until we reach uh, 1204, which is the fourth crusades. So I thought the most significant about this part, the third part, the secrets of Karbala, is the involvement of the, of the Venetians in the third, in, on the fourth crusades. So I would like to, to tell this story very, very quickly uh, of the fourth crusades. Um, so before the fourth crusades, what happened that a very important <coughs> leader for the Muslims called Salah al-Din managed to capture Jerusalem finally after, uh, after the crusaders uh, uh, settled in it for about 88 years. So having back Jerusalem was something extremely important and significant, of course, for, for, for Muslims, but at the same time was also another uh, reason for the, for the crusaders that are uh, coming from Europe to try to get it back. So this time, uh, they decided to go, so I would say in the beginning of all the trips, the first and the second and third crusades, they used to go through Constantinople, they, go, they, they used to go through the land. And this time they, they decided to go through the sea. So they went to Venice and uh, they made a deal with Doge Dandolo, the Doge of Venice during this time. And this deal is the following, that they will give Doge Dandolo I think it was about uh, uh, 84,000 golden marks, or something like this. And Doge Dandolo is responsible to build ships for them, about 250 ships that will be traveling the following year from Venice to Alexandria, and then from Alexandria they can go to Cairo, and of course if they capture Cairo, they can easily capture Jerusalem. And it seems that Doge Dandolo managed to make these ships, but the, the French leaders could not really collect the money that they promised. So when they arrived to Venice the following year, and Doge Dandolo didn't find that they had enough money, they had to make a new deal. And the new deal was instead of going to Alexandria, Doge Dandolo asked them to bring all their soldiers, all the crusaders, to go to Zara instead. And the, the, Zara is a Christian city, so the soldiers refused because they said, how come, with the name of Jesus Christ, we will go attack another Christian city? But anyway, that was the, the debate that, in the end, they accepted to go there because they had to, because they owe Doge Dandolo money. So they went to Zara, thinking that they will just collect some money from Zara and then they go to Alexandria. But what happened also that they could not find enough, I mean, they waited for till the end of the winter and they finished all their food and money. So they had to come up with another idea to continue the war. So someone came with this fantastic idea that they, instead of going to Alexandria to attack Alexandria, Actually, they decided to go to Constantinople, which is, again, a Christian city. The soldiers, again, refused. They said, it's a Christian city. How come we will attack a Christian city? But the, the reason here was, was really good that Doge Dandro told them that these people are Orthodox. They're not good Catholics. So you can still kill them, and you will go to heaven. So they decided that they will go to Constantinople. And that was the end, actually, of the movie and the end of the, of the Fourth Crusades. And I found that it's important to make this Fourth Crusades the final to show that it was not really a Muslim-Christian conflict. It was economical, it was clearly economical. It maybe started with a dream by Pope Urban II, and maybe it was really religious, but in the end it turned into a complete economical uh, reason. So, yeah.
자세하게 그 4차까지 진행됐던 시카고 원정의 어떤 그 정말 핵심적인 이유가 그 무엇이었으며 그 어떻게 변질되어 갔는지를 들을 수 있어서 굉장히 흥미로운 이야기였던 것 같고요. 일단 그 제작 과정의 얘기를 좀 이제 더 들어봤으면 좋겠습니다. 그러니까 나무 마리오네트를 가지고 만들 때와 또 도자기 인형을 만들 때, 또 크리스탈을 만들 때 이게 제작 과정이 또그 각계의 작업이 어 제작비 지원되는 것도 다 달랐고 또 그것을 제작됐던 장소도 다 달랐던 걸로 알고 있는데 어뭐 여러 가지 이유들이 있었겠지만 은어그 어떤 그 모델을 가지고 어 인형들을 그 디자인하게 됐는지 예를 들면 저희는 이제 이렇게 볼때 이게 무슨 곤충처럼 보이기도 하고 어떤 때는 뭐 무슨 양의 이뭐탈 뭐 같기도 하고 그래서 굉장히 그로테스크한 그런 이미지로 어 보여지는데 이런 그 인형을 디자인하게 하는 모델과 또 어떤 식으로 이거를 그이 소공업으로 다 만들었을 텐데 만들게 됐고 그리고 또 아울러서 이다 만들어진 것그 인형들을 어, 촬영은 어떤 컨티뉴이트인 걸 직접 아마도 영화를 보게 되면 컨티로 다 이렇게 어, 스토리보드를 만들어서 구성해서 이 촬영을 한것 같은 느낌을 받는데 어떤 식으로 촬영이 진행됐는지 어, 이야기 구체적인 이야기들을 좀 들었으면 좋겠습니다. Well, as I spoke about already, I spoke about the the way of making the the ceramic marionettes. So yeah, it's uh, it was yeah, it was made in with with people who had this uh, technique of making sandals, as I said, in South France. Uh, I think also the location of production for this film is extremely important. Um, I feel like really, really uh, lucky to, to have productions in Italy, France, Germany, the main forces behind the Crusades, actually. I feel really important. I think sometimes when I think about the production in this film, I find it even more important that it's produced in Europe, even more important than producing this in the Arab world. And I think sometimes I was really feeling great that in one of the sets, on the, when we are like really filming uh, any of the scenes, I look around me and I find over maybe 80 or 100 person, none of them speaks Arabic. I'm the only one who speaks Arabic and classical Arabic. And in that case, and everybody is really um, trying to help to make this film to reach and to be very uh, specific and uh, accurate about even the, the costume, the light, and the movement of the camera, everything. And uh, I find this is really uh, important because in the end we're speaking about one of the, like let's say the, the, the bloodiest history with the Arab the, for, the, for Europe. And when they are okay to make this history with me, I think this is really great. Um, so when I went to to, when I decided to make these marionettes in glass, as I said, it was connected to the story of the Venetians. That's why I decided to make the marionette out of Murano glass. Uh, so, yeah, making the ceramic uh, marionettes, as you were mentioning, it's a bit grotesque. Yes, it has this, I think it's, it's but it's also uh, it's the way I'm usually making drawings. It's like usually the same. These characters that is uh, that is uh, uh, hybridity between animal and human being is really appears a lot in my drawings, and I find that this was really the closest to to talk about this uh, type of figures. Plus, also there is. Uh, um, I find it's the, there's there's a history in in uh, in, in the Arab uh, literature where you find uh, you find um, animals telling stories, 
and yeah of course that exists in, in India and in Iran as well and but I, I found that this is really really important to to try not to show a certain figure as uh, good or bad in most of the time really it's more like neutral we're speaking more about just the, the historical translation without trying to be emotional and I think that's also why I'm using marionettes because I'm trying not to show uh, acting a way of, of, of a topic that is depending on the actor skills it's more like depending on the topic itself and the lyrics and the, and the music and so on and so uh, another part also is is not to uh, to concentrate on gender issue so it becomes just a society it's just a figure so you really don't care if it's uh, if it's uh, uh, a woman or a man this is really important in using marionettes so um, um, for the glass marionette, I went to Murano and I lived in Murano for about eight months. Uh, worked with a, a factory called Berengo Factory. It was really, really great and helpful for me to make uh, these marionettes. I worked with masters who really like, I think, also they are disappearing. These masters in, in Venice are really about to disappear because it's a very traditional uh, way of making handmade blown glass. Um, yeah, so uh, it was a big challenge because nobody knows, if even not me, not even the masters, that they can make marionette glass. It's really nobody knew, so it was something for the first time will happen. We just had to try elements next to each other and just try to so it took us really, really long time and many, many broken pieces until we reach what we want in the end. Uh, but also, there is another reason to use glass, actually. It's not only the, the political involvement of the Venetians in the Fourth Crusades. It's also, I remember, like, I believe it was like maybe 20 years ago or something, I read a novel by José Saramago the gospel according to Jesus Christ. I think it was really, really effective, this novel for me, because I remember Jose Saramago was trying to imagine Jesus Christ speaking to God and asking God why we are that fragile, why we're not made out of light, so we're, why we are breakable. So for me, this idea that we are, yes, we are fragile to the degree that we are, can be finished in one accident. That was really important to translate this uh, marionettes with glass. Okay, maybe the last thing I would like to speak about in the third part is the, the way it's, the sonography is made. And it's based on what we can see now. It's, uh, okay, so, we just like had, we were like, I, during this time I, I was searching for maps for, again, for the, for the world and how people imagine the world during this time. So all the world, all the maps, okay, was similar to this, where it was the idea that the earth is the center of the universe and the human being is the center of the universe as well, the earth. So that's why I decided to make the scenography of the third film is circles with remote control actually. It's moving like three circles and it's moving in different directions and different speeds. Uh, and in that case, most of the scenes you see the main characters are standing in the center of this stage and everything around them in rotation. So they are always in the center of the universe. Uh, just to translate uh, the, the, yeah, our, our perception about, about ourself as human being in this, in this time, the time of the Crusades.
This is one of the examples. This is this is someone called Al Add, and he's uh, the last Fatimid Caliph. After his death, he's really he, you don't have any ينبغي تأكيد هذا التحالف الرسمي باليد ماذا تقول؟ مولانا يمد يده؟ هذه إهانة سيدي الصدق ليس لديه ما يخفي وإذا لم تمد يدك عارية فسنضطر إلى الاعتقاد بأن هناك نقصا في الإخلاص هذا تطاول لن نسمح بهذا أبدا يضمن عموري ملك بيت المقدس دون خداع أو نية شريرة إبادة أو طرد شريكوه وجيشه السني بالكامل من الأراضي المصرية وذلك لقاء زيادة الجزية السنوية على المصريين ولكن لماذا يطلق المصريون على الخليفة الفاطمي اسم مولانا؟ I'm showing that Pope Urban II is manipulated as well. It's the same. So it's a metaphor for sure. But at the same time, I think it's uh, it's also coming from previous work that I made. I worked with kids a lot. And I work with kids maybe for the same reason. Because uh, one of the, of the examples I always... Uh, talk about is, is a piece called Telematch Sadat, where is, um, I brought, um, yeah, it's over like maybe it was like 80 kids uh, to play or to reenact the assassination of the President Sadat in 1981, and also the funeral of the President Sadat. For me, that was also very important to try to see this assassination from a different point of view. When I was a kid, I was just sitting in front of TV and I, and I was just watching the, this assassination happen in front of me with all the, like, uh, uh, the sh camera shaking and all of this. For me, this information that we have from, or the docu documentary that we have from this assassination is similar to using the historical text. It's really equivalent because we're just using what we have. So I decided to use the same angles of the camera to describe sort of another translation for the assassination of Sadat. Using kids, in that case, kids don't know really anything about, they don't know who Sadat is. They don't know what they're talking about. And it's very important, in that case, they don't act. They're just following what we tell them. So run from here to here, hold this gun, walk here. And this is for me extremely important because there is no emotion. 
in it. It's just someone really had a hand making the, the, the event. And yeah, to develop this the same concept, it became Marinette. And I think Marinette is even more successful in that sense because there is no, yeah, it's like killing all the emotional aspects. And again, the, this is what I'm saying always, it's just like uh, showing, of course, this, this type of manipulation. And also I believe that it's uh, most of the time I found it more easier for for the viewer to project himself or herself on the marionettes more than projecting themselves on an actual actor or human being because the human being loses its credibility after time. I don't know why. I, this is at least how I feel. But I don't find that this is happening with a marionette. Uh, as you said, the second film focuses on the political crisis uh, in the Arab, Arab war, and, um, which also both uh, led to, the, led to the, the events of the Crusaders' forces, uh, somehow. And um, I'd like to ask if in the Arab world, or I don't know, among the Sunnis or Shitas, uh, um, if it has uh, the, the historical period has been re rescued to reinforce the anti Western uh, feeling. And uh, I ask this in. I'm sorry, can, can you repeat this again? Sorry. Uh, uh, the, the last part. The, just, just the last part. Uh, if the, this historical period, yes. the, the Crusades, have been um, rescued as a source to reinforce the anti-Western uh, feeling, uh, which we can see um, uh, now, nowadays, uh, I ask this with no intention to offend, I hope. Um, but I see it as a very uh, good, uh, uh, it, it, it has a get great parallel uh, uh, among uh, other, um, other cultures. Uh, for example, I'm from Brazil, yes. and there are uh, lots of, of historical periods which um, create, uh, uh, are, are told uh, today in uh, history classes. Which are um, which construct a history of resentment, and I like to know if it's if it's something told in the in the in your history. I'd say. Yeah, actually, I find it very interesting what you're saying. Truly interesting because uh, if I understood it correct, um, yeah, th that's that's one of the opinions that I'm even hearing from some of the intellectuals in the Middle East that uh, it was used not just for the hatred actually it was just used as a tool for dictatorships actually it's like as 
Oh, yeah, similar to what America was doing, for example, to attack Iraq. That's one of the things. So we're just trying to use the Muslim terrorism as an excuse. So, yeah, that's possible. That's possible that, that, uh, that this topic was used for some of the, I don't want to say dictatorship, but okay, uh, leaders, Islamic leaders, to also to, to gain more power within their, their countries or their fields. That's possible. But I really don't think that, uh, I'm trying not to be, what I'm thinking that I'm doing really is not to build an archive, a historical archive about the Crusades history from, from the Arab point of view. I really, really think that I'm trying to, to make a sort of translation for this written history that I don't know how, how correct it is into this new readable format. And I find that this is really more important, um, important role for the artist, more than trying to be the one who knows, because I really don't know, it's history. I, this is, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, we cannot deny also that when, when America decided to attack Iraq, it was also triggering this, uh, this history, a thousand years old. So everyone was talking about this, including George Bush himself, that this is a new crusade. So it means that it still uh, exists in our memory. So it was 200 years, maybe within these 200 years, of course, a lot of massacres happened, but it was not as big, for example, as the First World War, or the, it's really, you cannot really make a comparison. But it, 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 uh, it constructed the relationship between the West and the East somehow, or the Arab and the Europeans, and still exists in the memory. So we have to try to, to work with it, I believe, to understand why this is happening, or to, to make sort of analysis. Um, so I have some Arabic word, yeah, friend that tell me that there are different kinds of Arabic. Um, for instance, like, oh, that, I don't know, for instance, like Moroccans, they don't understand, or their Arabic, they can't be understood by um, Saudi Arabians and so on. And I was wondering, because um, I didn't understand, I don't know Arabic, um, what kind of Arabic it was, and, um, um, and uh, who the intended audience for the whole series was, and, if it was for a global audience or if it was for a specific audience and if you've shown these uh, the series to different audiences like Sunni, Shia and other people and what their reactions were. Yeah, okay, so it's uh, the, the series are all in classical Arabic, which is the, the language of Quran, basically. So all the Arab countries can understand this language. Mm, yes, if you're talking about uh, dialect, a different uh, way of, yeah, of course. Most of the Arab countries understand Egyptians when they speak because of the, of the, me of the media and the movies and, and so on. Most of the media is coming from, from Egypt. So yeah, they understand. But we, it's a bit difficult, for example, for us to understand Tunisians, although they understand us, or Moroccans, or Algerians. So it's, it depends, yeah, it depends where are they coming from, but I'm just saying that the, uh, yeah, that's one, one of the things. The other thing is the, where I showed the film. I showed these films almost, I mean, not everywhere, of course, but in many, many, many places. Uh, showed them also in the Arab countries, but I did not show them unfortunately yet in Egypt. But this is happening because I have like a <coughs> sort of political decision not to show in Egypt now because the situation is really not pleasant. <laughs> and by showing 
in Egypt and exhibiting in Egypt, it's like as if we're trying to suggest that we agree on the current situation, and I don't really agree on the current situation, that's all. Uh, so, yeah, it's been almost now six years. I'm not showing in Egypt, but I kept uh, Mass Alexandria, which is a school that uh, I funded in, in 2010, before the revolution in Egypt. Uh, I kept it running actually, and it's just for it's a non profit uh, school for young students. And I find this is what I really can participate in in Egypt now, but not to, to show. Um, I showed this to, yeah, it was, it was interesting to, for example, I showed it once in, uh, in Sharjah, and uh, a friend of mine was telling me uh, about Hassan Sabah, the figure that I showed, and it's, I was saying always that this is a bit sensitive. And uh, she's originally from Pakistan, actually, and she was telling me that uh, Hassan Sabah is not Shia because he's Ismaili and Adari. So I didn't know if this is really. I didn't know, I mean, I, this is the information that I have, maybe I'm wrong, but from my information that Ismaili Nazari is a sect that is split from another sect, which is called Ismaili. So Ismaili is a sect from Shia, and Ismaili Nazari is another sect from Ismaili. So it's all Shia in the end, for, for my understanding, for my learning. It's not about attacking Shia or attacking Sunnah. In fact, of course, I am Sunnah because I'm coming from a certain place. But the idea is, for me in this film, is not really about showing who is good and who is bad. In fact, everybody is bad in this film. It's, like there is no, it's, uh, it's clearly from the secrets of Karbala. It's, uh, as I said, it's uh, people who they are consider them, themselves, Sunnah, are really the one who killed the grandson of the prophet. So, I, yeah. So, uh, it's interesting to 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 see the reaction of people because, but I try to be as as neutral as possible. Yeah. <laughs> 굉장히 객관적으로 철저하게 자료들을 또그 연구하시고 하셔서 어 그것을 기반으로 해서 어, 어 각기 다양한 인용 소재를 갖고 만든 삼부작 완성된 삼부작에 관련된 제작 과정에 거친 이야기들을 물론 어그 하나하나 좀더더 세부적인 이야기들 하자고 하면 어 굉장히 많은 시간을 필요로 하겠죠. 그래서 아쉽지만은 어 대략적인 어떤 이야기를 듣는 그런 시간을 가졌습니다. 어, 와이샤키 감독님 너무 감사드리고요. 어, 와주신 관계 여러분들 감사합니다. 감사합니다.